What am I going to be if I can't even hold my wife's hand? It's a lie to think that you're not good enough. It's a lie to think that you're not worth anything. Oh boy. I can't feel my hands. <laughs> I love life. You know, so many people come and say, how come you smile so much? And I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> but it's very simple at the same time. You see, it's very hard to smile sometimes in life. There are things that happen that you don't know and you don't understand and you don't know if you're going to get through it. You know, you go through your storms in life and you don't know how long this storm is going to be. And today I want to share with you some principles that I've learned in my life that you can use in yours. Being patient is beautiful. I, I tell you, it's the hardest day. But I realize I may not have hands to hold my wife's hand. But when the time comes, I'll be able to hold her heart. I don't need hands to hold her heart. You know, it is scary to know how many girls have eating disorders. It is scary to know how many people are just angry at life because of their situation at home and angry at others. It's scary to know how many people actually feel like they're worth nothing. Every single girl right here, right now, I want you to know that you are beautiful. You are gorgeous just the way you are. And you boys, you the man. <laughs> On this DVD, I share my experiences in life of how I've overcome challenges and seen a new, fresh perspective in life. To be thankful, to dream big, and to never give up. I speak to children, youth, and adults about key issues and principles that I've applied in my life that has given me the strength to conquer all that comes before me. Amen, and you thought you had issues, right? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Nick as he goes around the world sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and being an evangelist both in schools and across this planet, Lord. And Lord, how he gives you the praise and the glory and the thanks for everything that you have blessed him with. And so, Lord, I pray today that we would continue to learn the art of thank you, that we would continue to understand how important it is to give you thanks. And Lord, we ask your sweet spirit to be here in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the art of thank you. And in the midst of the art of thank you, I shared this one slide. It says, the greatest test of faith is when you don't get what you want, but still you're able to say thank you to the Lord. So we really need to understand that it doesn't matter what happens to us in our life. What really matters is our attitude, right? What really matters is our perception of life, how we look at life, how we perceive God, how we think of God. And so I want to challenge you to think about Nick's situation for a moment. And by the way, this is Nick's family. Now there's a miracle. That's his wife, by the way, and that's his two kids. And he never thought at one point in his life when he was 12 years old, he tried to drown himself in his bathtub because he didn't think he'd ever have a wife and he would never have kids. And I want you to know that at that point, the Lord spoke to him when he was trying to drown himself in the bathtub and said, Nick, you are the way I created you, and I will use you to change millions of lives for me. All you got to do is get up, give it your whole heart, trust me, and I'll take care of the rest. And here he is years later. He's got two kids. He's got a great wife. And he says he's ministered to, they say, over a million people in the world that he has preached to. 
And he not only preaches and does evangelistic things, and he preaches for companies. He goes in and does motivational uh, uh, teaching for Fortune 500 companies. And he goes in and speaks in schools, and he shares about, it doesn't matter what your disability or what your setback in life might be. What really matters is this. It's your attitude. It's how you look at things. Are you thankful for what you have? Are you grateful for what you do have? And he even said it in our little clip here. He kind of uh, showed his little foot there, and he says he's thankful for his little stub that he has that. And I sometimes think we don't understand the importance of how important it is for us to be grateful. To be grateful for what God has blessed us with. And, 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 you know, we've been talking about the art of thank you and painting the picture of thank you and how important it is. And, and I have some of our things on the left. We'll, our big thank you board we did on, New, uh, on uh, it would be Thanksgiving Eve. And we wrote on the board on Thanksgiving Eve what it was we were thankful for. And if you also recall, the Sunday before that, Pastor Brennan preached a great message. Wouldn't you say amen to that? Great message on how we have to be thankful in the beginning and in the end of this continuum of life. And, it, and really, the, the attitude is we need to be thankful in all circumstances, at all times, before, during, and after whatever it is that's happening to us in life. It's, it's cultivating a heart of thank you. And, and I don't know, I was thinking about, you know, what were some other things that I could write on the board over there? I, by the way, wrote, I was thankful for my church, which I truly am. But I really started thinking about this. I am so thankful for this younger generation, for guys like Brendan and Donald, and this next generation, and Vernon and Ashley, and this generation that's coming up, and you know what? They're going after God with their whole heart, amen? And I'm thankful for that, because I'm an old guy now. How do I know I'm old? I got my first senior citizen discount two weeks ago. <laughs> my wife couldn't believe it. We were going to Josh's play, and the lady says, if you're 55 and older, you get a discount to go to the play. She goes, how old are you, sir? I go, well, I'm 56. And she goes, you get a senior discount. And my wife comes up to pay because she always takes the money. So she has the money. And the lady says, that, oh, you're, you're giving me too much money. And she goes, no. And, and, and she goes, well, well, he gets the senior discount. She looks at me. He's not a senior. I'm like, I'm 56 years old. I'm over 55. And she's like, oh, you are? You're that old? <laughs> and I got a compliment, though. I think the lady was feeling bad for me at the other side of the counter. And she looks at me and says, you don't look that old, sir. You're doing okay. I was like, thank you. I'm doing okay. So we have to have and cultivate this attitude of gratitude, this heart of thanks. And, and as we decide how we're going to create this masterpiece of this art of thank you in our lives, we've been kind of showing different ways we can be thankful for. And, and, and then there's the basket over there. If you remember that, we kind of did that too, where you wrote a thank you note to God, and you wrote it on kind of an index card, and we put them in the basket. Many great thank yous in there to what God has done for specific individuals, for specific situations and circumstances. So we must cultivate a grateful heart with the Lord and learn the art of thank you to the Lord and to others. And thank you has the power to change our heart and others' hearts. It can even transform our daily life and even our environment. We talked about how important it is to know that if we learn the art of thank you, we can change our work environment, our school environment, our family environment, our holidays, amen? See, all these things come into play when we learn the art of thank you. And so as we continue to look at this art of thank you, we're going to look at one last passage of Scripture. It is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, looking at verses 11 to 19, and if you would turn there with me, please. We come to the ten lepers. <clears throat> and the ten lepers is an interesting story of Jesus who's coming along, and he runs into these ten lepers, and they've probably been waiting for him, I think. And I want you to listen to the story. Listen to what it says here in Luke. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, verse 11, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, 
and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, some translations, they cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. And I want you to kind of just get into this scenario a little bit. I want you to really think about this. Here's Jesus and his disciples. And by the way, if you're not sure of the time frame of what's happening, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die. He knows this. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to give up his life. He's on his way to Jerusalem to fulfill what the Father had called him to do, and that was, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whomsoever should believe on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus is going to put this into play very shortly. He knows this. And here he is. He's coming down the road. He's probably at the, at the height of his popularity. He's got this huge entourage with, with him. There's been all kinds of talk about him. All kinds of miracles have been happening. He's been doing all kinds of different miracles from feeding people uh, to healing people. And interesting enough, even before this, if you go all the way back in Luke, a few chapters back, we find another scenario where Jesus ran into a person, an individual who had leprosy, and he laid his hands on and he prayed for him and he was completely healed instantaneously. And I'm sure that it just kept spreading. I'm sure when that leper was healed, I don't think he kept it quiet. Do you think he kept it quiet? I think he ran back to the leper colonies where he was living and said, this man prayed for me, and I was, I was like I was, and I was instantaneously healed. And, and so here they are. Here's this group. He's passing through. He sees them off in a distance because, once again, they're lepers. If you know anything about leprosy, it is a very debilitating disease. Really, leprosy, what it does is starts to destroy your nerves and your feelings in your body. And so what you do is you start to injure yourself, but you don't know you injure yourself. And then pretty soon it gets infected, and, and leprosy has a tendency. It's a skin disease that it'll cause your fingers to fall off, your toes to fall off, your, your limbs to fall off, your face to distort. All these boils and sores are all over the place. And it is a horrible disease, and it was also in those days very, very contagious. So they were banned from society. They were the, the ones who were cast out of society to live in what they would call leper colonies. Now, most of the leper colonies, by the way, were not nice places. They were filthy and smelly. And by the way, I'll give you a story in a second. I did, I have prayed for three people who had leprosy in India. And I'll tell you that story in a moment. But they smell really bad because of the rotting flesh. And they usually lived outside the dumps because that's kind of how they made their living. They had to eat, but they were banned from their families. They were banned from the loving hugs of their kids. No longer able to get a hug from your child. Can you imagine? No longer able to be embraced by your spouse. No longer able to hang out with your family on Thanksgiving and have a great day together. Isolated by yourself outside the village so you would not contaminate or get anybody else infected with the disease. And so here's these 10 lepers who have lost basically everything, their jobs, their families, their health, their income. And they hear in the midst of the scuttle of Jesus coming, he prayed for a leper and he was healed. Could you imagine their hope? Could you imagine their hopeless situation? 
that they don't think there's any hope anymore because their distant memories remind them of a time when they were loved and hugged, when they could hold down a job, when they were part of society and part of their family and the family celebrations and all the great stuff. They remember a time when they could participate in all that, but now with leprosy, they could not. They were alone, banished, isolated, lonely. So they hung out with other lepers. And so these 10 guys are all hanging out together, wallowing, you could say, in their misery. No hope, no future, no love, no touches, no hugs, no kisses, no I love yous. Trying to survive in the dumps, trying to survive from handouts. Their life does not look like it has a future. They're hobbling around on stumps that used to be legs. They try and use their hands, but missing most of their fingers. And they hear about this guy named Jesus. And in our scenario, they see him coming. And can you just think for your can go back in time with me. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine their pain and suffering? Can you imagine their loneliness and depression? Can you empathize with their hopeless outlook on life? Can you imagine their desperation? They were living in the worst conditions imaginable, way worse than any poverty conditions you can imagine here in the United States. They are watching their bodies rot away from decay and deform, but they are also dying inside from a lack of love, a lack of touch, a lack of loved ones, no hugs, no kisses, no warm embrace, no I love you. They are isolated from their kids, grandkids, spouses, and families. They're cast away to the outskirts of society to die in agonizing, lonely death. Can you just imagine them? And they hear this news of this guy named Jesus who healed one leper man instantaneously when he laid his hands on him. And he's coming. He's just down the road. They can hear the crowd gathering. They can hear the people. He's coming. He's coming. Listen up, guys. He's coming. They still can't get in with the crowd. They can't push into Jesus. They can't touch anybody. They can't, like all the other people were doing, kind of pushing in like the woman with the issue of blood who could push in and touch the hem of Jesus' garment to be healed. They can't do that. They have to stand back off away from everybody else and yell, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, and they're, they're probably holding each other up and they're, they're waving their stumps that used to be hands and they're, they're, they're probably some of them on canes and they're totally deformed and they're wrapped in filthy, filthy you know, like drop cloths around their face and, and they just smell and they reek and they're, they're crying out and they're holding each other up, crying out to Jesus because he is their only hope. They've heard he can heal a leper. They've heard the stories. Maybe they even heard it from the one leper who was healed. I don't know. But they're waiting for Jesus in this moment, in this place, off the side of the road, and they see him coming. And they're yelling, and they're screaming, and they're crying out, and they're thinking of the distant memories of the past and how it would be so amazing for them to once again receive back what they have lost. When I had prayed for three lepers... I was in Banaganapali, India. We had just finished a Jesus festival there. We had ministered to over 20,000 people had come out. Over 7,000 people had gotten saved that night. And then we prayed for anybody that had, you know, anything they needed prayer for. And we had about almost 12,000 people come forward for prayer. And there were four of us, Dr. Nichols, myself, my oldest daughter, Tiffany, and one other person who was with us, Jerry, on that trip. And so we broke off into four groups. Tiffany, by the way, was only 16 at the time. And I said to Tiffany, I said, Tiffany, uh, you go over there with Pastor Gabriel. He'll interpret for you, and you just start praying. Because how many know 12,000 people is a whole lot of people? And they're all crowding around you. And they all want you to touch them. And so we're praying and praying. And we probably prayed. I'm not killing. This was, we started around, somewhere around, I think it was 1030 at night. And by the time we were done for praying, and we prayed for every single person, it was about 1.30 in the morning. It was, a, it was a lot of prayer. And I got to admit, I was kind of exhausted, okay? And 
And so we, you know, we were done. We were done praying for everybody. A bunch of people got saved. We got them cards and Bibles and everything was kind of set. And we just get back to the Land Rovers and I just get in the Land Rover. I just sit back in the seat and say, man, thank you, Jesus, for this amazing night. But man, I'm really tired <laughs> praying for all these people. And then there's a knock at the window of my door. And it's our crusade director, Pastor Stefan. He said, Pastor Mike, he goes, these three lepers have journeyed a long way to come to this festival. And they, they, they kind of saw you praying for people and they want you to pray for them. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, here we go again, <laughs> you know. So I get out. They're... I get out of the truck, I walk toward them. It's, it's rather dark, but probably from here to the wall, I could smell them. It, it's the most, if you've ever smelt rotting, dying flesh, it smells horrible. I could smell them that far away. The closer I got, the stronger it got. And they were all three standing there. Two people were helping them stand. One was kind of laying on the ground. He couldn't stand. And I remember the three of them looked at me and said, and that's what they said to me, please pray for us and give us hope. So I did. I laid my hands on all three of them. And I prayed for all three of those guys. And, and you know what? I felt the presence of God. I, I don't know what happened to them because they never came back. After that night, we never saw them again. Pastor Stefan came to me and said, I tried following up on them, Mike. I don't know what happened to them. We know they journeyed a long way. You prayed for them. And then the next day, they were gone. We don't know what happened to them. And so I want you to know, even in that darkness, you could see their deformities. You could see them. They were all wrapped up in the bandages, and they were hiding their faces and their arms. And, and the one just had a stump of a left because all his fingers were gone. And so I prayed for these guys. So I know the situation for these people are, is, is very dire. It's very desperate. And I think about that moment in time in my life, which I'll never forget, and I just think about how terrible this disease was, how it rots and falls off your limbs, how many lepers lose all their fingers and toes because of this disease, how painful it is, how smelly. You could tell if a person had leprosy because their body would be covered in sores. You couldn't hide leprosy. It was so obvious. And they see Jesus coming. And they have a glimmer of hope. And as I think about these ten lepers and their glimmer of hope, I, they're jumping, they're shouting, and, and Jesus, in the midst of the crowd, because he's probably surrounded by the crowd, he stops. He probably parts the crowd and says, hey, guys, can, can you move to the side? I, I see these, these ten gentlemen over here who need something from me. And they're crying, Jesus, have mercy on us. It's interesting, you don't cry, Jesus, heal me. They cry, Jesus, have mercy on me. Well, it's interesting, in those days, leprosy was always kind of symbolically tied with sin. It was always tied with sin because in the religious teachers and leaders of the day, they would basically say that leprosy is so like what sin does to our bodies without us knowing what it's doing. See, because leprosy, you don't know that you've injured yourself, you're infected, and you're going to lose a finger. You don't have any feeling. And so they say there's this, this tie-in that this leprosy and sin are kind of paralleled in Scripture, and they, it's used as a teaching tool, but it's this idea that we injure ourselves with sin every day. We just don't know how bad we're injuring ourselves with sin every day. And yet that sin will eventually take my finger. Eventually that sin will take my next finger. Eventually, that sin will distort my face. It'll start to make me smell. People won't want to be around me. I'll lose my family as a result of that sin. I'll be isolated from society. I'll be cast out as a cast out. I'll lose my job because of that sin. You getting the picture? So the religious leaders of the day kind of associated it with sin. So these guys just cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. In other words, heal us. Save us, forgive us of our sin. And, and, and there was kind of everything wrapped up in a salvation call and, and kind of everything happening in this moment. And, and what does Jesus do? Does he run over there and lay his hands on him like he did the other leper? No, he doesn't do that. He stands at a distance, looking at the 10, and he says something that I think kind of baffled our, 
our lepers, I, I think they were a little bit like, did he just say what I thought he said? Did he just say, um, go show yourselves to the priest? In other words, they're, they're looking at him. They're still deformed. They're still smelly. They're still hurting. They're still not, you know, they heard about him touching the other guy. He was instantaneously healed, but there's no instantaneous healing, and they're standing there, and he says, hey, go show yourself to the priest. You know, there's this element of faith there, isn't there? The other leper didn't have to deal with that. He was just touched and healed instantaneously. And Jesus says, go. That's the act of faith there, by the way. You have to go and show yourself to the priest. So I'm sure they're looking at each other, and they're looking for each other to be healed because they heard he healed the other person instantaneously, and they're looking at each other, and everything's looking the same, and they still hurt, and they still smell, and, and they're still deformed, and, and they're looking, the tenor just kind of looking at each other, and nothing's happening, and Jesus says, go. Go show yourself to the priest. Why should they go show themselves to the priest? Well, you see, it was the priest who said to them one day, when they got leprosy, you need to leave the colony, you're done, get out. You're contagious, you need to go. And so they, they start on their journey back to, to the priest, and, and amazingly, as they're on their journey, as they're going their way, as they're progressing toward the priest, things start to happen. He, he, fingers start to appear. Healing starts to happen. Faces start to shape back up. Sores start to disappear. They start walking better. They start feeling better. And by the time they get to the priest, the priest looks at them, probably in utter amazement, because he probably knew all of them. He probably banished all of them out to where they were. And he looks at them and says, you guys are healed. You guys are free. You've been delivered. Now, think of that moment with me. What do you think they did? Oh, that was nice. I'm healed. Think they did that? I think they jumped around a lot. I think, I think they were kind of like, well, when the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> right? I mean, there's celebration going on, you know. They're dancing in the streets, you know, and they're having a good old time, and, and they're celebrating because this is a miracle. You got it? This is a miracle. And, and, they're, and then, you know, they're probably jumping up and down with each other, probably hugging each other, and, and they're just shouting at the top of their lungs that they've been healed, and the priest is probably just in utter amazement going, I, I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> He's just looking on because they're healed. But if we read our story... We find that only one out of the ten returned to Jesus. Ever thought about that? Ten of them supernaturally healed. All the things we talked about, gone. Supernaturally touched physically. Their families are going to be restored. Most likely their jobs are going to be restored. They're allowed back into society. They can be and feel the hugs and the kisses of their family once again. All those great things, they get it back. I don't know. What kind of a mindset when you're supernaturally healed like that doesn't go praise the God who healed you? Doesn't go back to the one who spoke life into your bodies, healing into your bodies, and you go back to say, thank you. And I find it amazing about our story because as you read this story, we've read, if you read the Gospels, a lot of healings of Jesus, many different types, many different kinds, many different types of miracles in different kinds. And you come to this one, and really the emphasis is not on the ten being healed, if you really look at it. It's really on the emphasis that nine of them didn't say thank you to God for their healing. I think Jesus is as amazed as the man who was amazed that was healed. Because they come back and Jesus is like, well, where's the other nine? What happened to them? No response, by the way. No answer to his question. But he came back, gave praise to God, got on his knees, praised God, thanked him, and gave him praise. And interesting enough, the other nine from our story, they were Jewish descent, which means they were God's chosen people, 
which means God had blessed their nationality and their generation for years and years and years with the blessings of God. And for some reason, those that had been given the most were not the ones thanking God. It was the Samaritan considered the hapri, considered the outcast of society. The Samaritans were considered outcasts. It was the one least likely to thank Jesus is the one who came back to thank him. And Jesus applauds his faith. Your faith has healed you. And he blesses him, sends him off. Because I am sure, as soon as Jesus blessed this man, you know what he did? He made a sprint. He made a dash to his family to get back with his family, to hug them and spend time with them and rejoice with them. I am absolutely convinced that's where he went. And I'm probably sure that's what happened to the other nine. But somewhere in the midst of their rejoicing, they totally forgot about the one who gave them the miracle. So here's your tie-in again. Isn't it amazing how we can take for granted when Jesus saves us? Because in a sense, the leprosy is kind of a symbolic story of God healing, yes, but it's also kind of the symbolism of God delivers us and sets us free from the sin that will destroy our lives. And we don't even thank him for what he did for us every day. I, a few years back, have tried to form a pattern in my life that every morning when I wake up, I say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for me. Why? I think it's so easy to forget. I really think it's easy to get caught up in the busyness of life and forget to thank God. And so... This one leper comes back, Jesus blesses him, he's healed of this debilitating disease, and and he's set free, and and, and you just come to the point, and and you just got to smile because it's a great story, amen? So let's kind of wrap up some lessons from our story. So as we look at the lessons from our story, we should always take the time to thank the Lord for his mercy, his forgiveness of sin, and for any healing that he has given us in our body, soul, and spirits. We should make sure we take the time to thank him. Secondly, healing can happen at a distance. Did you know that? See, all they had to do was cry out to Jesus for the healing. He never touched them. It says something about our prayers, amen? The prayers that we pray in our desperation by our bedside or in that desperate moment or in that foxhole moment, we cry out to the Lord to touch us, to heal us, to deliver us. And you know what? The amazing thing is he hears us and he does respond, amen? So he doesn't have to be in proximity. All he's got to do is hear your words, and he speaks his word, and it comes into existence. Thirdly, the foreigner, or the Samaritan leper, is the one who would be considered the furthest away from God than the others, yet he's the only one who comes and says thanks. I've always find it amazing that some of the people that were deeply, the deepest entrenched in sin, when they get delivered and set free, how thankful they are to the Lord. And how some of us who have been saved for years and years and years, we kind of take it for granted. So we do, some of us. I sometimes wonder if our Jewish individuals had what I call an entitlement mindset because they were God's chosen people. Well, that's what God should do for me. He should heal me. Well, really, no. But I think sometimes we can, if we don't guard our hearts, become kind of arrogant, kind of conceited, and kind of think that God owes us something. I've met people like that in my life too, by the way. When in reality, we owe God everything. We owe him for our salvation, for our blessings, for even the blessings on our families. I just, you know, I just sit there and think how blessed I am for for, for my family. I thought about it at Thanksgiving, how blessed I am to have the family I have because I never had that family growing up. But I do now. And it's passing the blessings of God on to the next generation, which I so love to do too. And my kids and grandkids. And see them love God. That's something to be thankful for. Amen? So as I kind of wrap things up here, I'm going to ask Ashley to come up to the piano. The last thing I want to say is we can appreciate God's blessings or not appreciate them. It's really our choice. But I want you to know something. God is observing how you respond to him when he blesses you. He is taking note. 
of whether you truly are grateful or not. And I don't know about you, but I really want God to look at me and say, yeah, way to go, Mike, for thanking me for that, for praising me for that, for lifting your hands and, and just remembering all that I've done for you. And, and, you know, that really honors God, amen? That's why we worship. That's why we did what we did. That's why we had Vernon Shearer's testimony today. We don't always see the big picture, but God's working it, amen? And we just need to understand and be thankful that God has everything worked out. And, and as these guys were healed and set free, there's one of them who was truly grateful for what God did for him. And I guess my challenge is, you are, are you grateful or ungrateful today? And, and maybe when we come to the conclusion of the matter and as we've been looking at the art of thank you, what do we really need to know? We need to make sure we thank the Lord for his miracles, for our salvation, for his intervention in our lives and answered prayers. Why do we need to know this? We need to know that this is how a grateful Christian acts according to Scripture. It shows a humble and thankful and grateful heart. And what do we need to do? We need to be thankful because God is taking notice of how we react to his miracles and his blessings in our life. So we need to practice the art of thank you because it has the power to change our lives, our hearts, our minds, and even change the environment around us. And then why do we need to do this? Well, when you do these things, it'll change people's hearts, it'll change their perception of life, and in turn, it will impact everybody around you. Two weeks ago, I was notified by a national organization that somebody within our community has nominated our church for the Outstanding Service of the Year Award in this county. <laughs> Don't know who it is, but he asked me if I would accept that nomination, this individual, and I said, sure. So I don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> but just to know that we were nominated, it has a lot to do, I think, with our outreaches, amen? with our cards we did for the different city officials and the policemen and the firemen, for helping people out at their homes and doing all the things we've been doing. And I truly thank God for that because isn't that what we're here to do? Amen? So I'm going to have Ashley play a song here at the end, and I want you to take, we've got a couple minutes left, and if you haven't had the chance when we conclude the service here, what I'd like you to do is if you haven't had a chance to tell God what you're thankful for, you haven't written it on the board, why don't you go do that today at the end of service? Or if you want to write God a thank you note, there are note cards there on the black table, and you can put it in the basket under the sign for thanks. But if you haven't had a chance to say thanks to God, think about this corner over here as kind of an offering corner of thanks to God. Amen? And take the time this morning as we wrap up this series on the art of thank you, because you know what? God loves it when we say thank you, and then you know what he does? I think he blesses us more. Amen? Amen. So let's stand. Okay? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for thanksgiving. We thank you that we have learned the art of being thankful within our lives, within our families, within our workplaces within our schools. And Lord, I pray that we would all cultivate an attitude of gratitude. I pray that we would cultivate hearts of thanksgiving. And I pray, Lord, that it wouldn't just be this time of the year that we do this, as Pastor Brennan shared a couple last week, but that we would have an attitude of gratitude before and after and all the way during through the rest of our lives. That each day we could wake up and say, thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for my family. And thank you for the blessings that I have in my life. And so, Lord, we just pray that we would just continue to cultivate a grateful heart. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like prayer for anything.